Welcome to Keep the Channel Open, a podcast featuring conversations with artists, writers, and curators. My name is Mike Sakasagawa, and this is episode 57. Today's guest is Lisa M. Robinson. Hey, everybody. I'm super excited about today's conversation. So instead of the usual monologue, let's just jump straight into the introductions, okay? Today's guest, Lisa M. Robinson, is a fine art photographer based in Tucson, Arizona. Her photographs have been exhibited both nationally and internationally, and they are included in the permanent collections of some museums, including SF MoMA, Museum of Fine Arts Houston, MOPA here in San Diego, Portland Art Museum, Nevada Museum of Art, Ogden Museum of Southern Art, and Telfair Museum of Art. Now, as you'll hear in just a minute, I first saw Lisa's work when she gave a presentation at the 2012 Medium Festival of Photography. That was the first ever Medium Festival. 2012 was an important year for me, mainly because of that first Medium Festival. It was the first time that I ever had a portfolio review or really even showed my work to anyone other than my wife and my close family. Lisa's presentation was one of the most memorable events of the whole festival for me um, because she not only showed her work, uh, which was mainly her series Snowbound, but she also gave this really in-depth look at her process. She even read excerpts from her personal journals, which, first of all, they were just beautifully written. But more than that, they really gave us in the audience a look at this sort of day-by-day -day development of a conceptual photographic project. Uh, you know, what she was thinking about as she worked, the different directions, false starts, turning points, all of that kind of thing. And between that and the just beautiful images that she showed, it really just opened up a lot of possibilities for me in terms of how to engage with landscape and narrative and concept and uh, how you can use photographs to convey emotion and, you know, inner states. Uh, so all of that is just to sort of say that I was just thrilled to get the chance to talk with Lisa for the show. And I hope you enjoy the conversation as much as I did. Now, before we get started, I just wanted to mention that Lisa, just last week, January 10th, she opened a new exhibition at Klumpching Gallery in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, it's a brand new solo show of the work we're going to be talking about in this episode. If you are in the New York area, the show will run through February 24th, so do go check it out. I've put a link in the show notes where you can get all of the details. I also put in some links to places where you can buy her book, Snowbound, which I highly recommend. I have a copy myself, and it's one of the photo books in my collection that I really come back to most often. So let's get started. If you'd like to join in the conversation, you can use the hashtag channelopenpod on Twitter. And now here's my conversation with Lisa M. Robinson. I'm really excited to be talking with you because um, I love your work so much and uh i i'm i'm a little afraid that i'm gonna like just geek out a little too much during this conversation oh my god but, that's so exciting to hear um, you have no idea that's wonderful i i uh so i first um you know became a, a familiar with your work through your presentation at the medium festival which i think was in 2012 it was the first year of medium yes it was and um and also, so I, and I bought your book, the Snowbound book, and I bought it directly from you. And it was the first photo book that I ever bought, actually, the first photo monograph that I ever oh bought. Oh, my God. I didn't realize that, Mike. That's <laughs> very um, meaningful to me. So thank you very much. This book has been hugely important to me. I just wanted to, to tell you that, that, that this book... Uh, was really something that, um, you know, I don't have a formal education in, in the arts or in photography. So a lot of it has just been sort of what I can find on my own. Your Snowbound book was really something that, that kind of unlocked the potential of landscape photography to be conceptual for me. You know, where I'm from, uh, up, up near Carmel, um, we have a pretty strong tradition of landscape up there, but it's, it's, it's sort of the more traditional, you know, silver print, you know, beautiful Ansel Adams kind of stuff. And while I do like that kind of stuff quite a bit still, it, the, what you're, what you do with landscape was, was unlike anything that I had ever experienced before and really just, the possibilities that it opened up for me in my own work were were 
it was significant for me. So I just wanted to, to say that to you and say thank you so much. <laughs> wow. Well, I want to thank you. I mean, I think, <laughs> I mean, honestly, as a photographer, I think the real gift of being a photographer is making the work mm. we make, the very process of, for me, going out into the world and having experiences and having thoughts and having ways in which my work influences or even enlightens me about my own life is so profoundly special. And as a photographer, I, I just cherish that experience and value it so much. And the part of the work that does involve communicating and sharing and expressing what I am experiencing or discovering about the world um, is up until the publication of Snowbound, I don't think I had fully experienced that power. Mm. And it's a very different um, gift in many ways. And so to hear that the work has gone out into the world and really resonated with another human being at a level, at such a level that it has impacted you in particular um, as, a, as, a, as a thinker, as a creator, as a person, is really, really wonderful wonderful to hear i i really i mean i can't um i i can't overstate how uh, how much um your your work has has really sort of challenged me to think about um, um especially because i encountered it you know fairly early on in my process of becoming an artist mm -hmm. um you know in 2012 when i saw your your presentation at medium um, I was really just getting started. That was, I did portfolio reviews that year and, um, you know, sort of the thing that was the, the general consensus among my reviewers was, you know, like this, these are, these are nice, but you, you need to keep working. You're not really there yet. And, and looking back, that was really true. And, you know, being, having the experience of, of, of seeing, um, really all of the lectures that year, but, but yours in particular really stood out to me, um, at that sort of moment in my career was really mind opening to me. I mean, mm. I, I feel like that's kind of a cliche way of putting it, but it, it really did. Um, cause I had no idea what I was doing, you know, and, and, and seeing other artists, what they're capable of doing. And, and in particular, in your presentation, the way that you sort of opened up and unpacked your process was just amazing to me. Um, and it was unlike anything that I had ever sort of considered before. So, you know. Well, it was, it was actually, I believe it may have been, it was definitely the first time that I ever did that in such a public way. So it was very um, risky and new for me to be so exposed um, and to reveal so much about my process. Mm -hmm. And um, at the time, I remember feeling that it was somehow important, in large part because I was thinking through so much at that time about this work that I'm doing now. Mm. And, um, and it was as much for me as it was potentially for somebody else, but it's wonderful to now know how impactful that was for you as someone in the audience. Yeah. It's something that I think that that thing that you just said about, it being as much for yourself as potentially for someone else. That that's something I think about a lot with my own work. I I, I I often sort of think about, you know, why am I doing this? Why am I making the work? And and it having the ability to communicate something is um is really something that 
I think I came to through understanding other people's work. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I get, I'm, I'm, I, I'm a little surprised to, to hear, I mean, it is the thing that you just said about that, the way that you presented your process and your work being risky, it is, you came across as so confident <laughs> when you were giving the presentation. <laughs> Isn't it remarkable how we managed to do that? We put on a cloak of a persona. Yeah. Um, and, and that's not to say that I'm not confident that what I'm doing is the right thing, if, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like, I know I, I have confidence in who I am as a person and what I do as an artist, but that's not to say that every step of the process is one of certainty because that's absolutely not true at all. <laughs> mm, yeah. So in the larger sense of things, I think I do have a foundation, but for me, the process of unraveling and exploring and discovering is one that is fraught with uncertainty. Mm. and um and vulnerability and exposure and the possibility of being take mistaken if that makes sense at an early stage and i think that's maybe what i was feeling at that time was mm. that um as i recall i was talking about a series of images that i had made um previously i was not in the midst of making that at that time mm -hmm. um i was talking about oceana which is a series of seascapes mm -hmm. and the thought processes that i was going through to think through that work as it was evolving and yet for me and maybe this links back to what i was saying about how this was as much about this was as much an exercise for myself at the time I was doing that very same searching. I was, I was so desperately seeking a way to access this new landscape that I had found myself in, mm. the desert. And so for me, at the same time that I was speaking and sharing that process from that particular body of work, I was maybe also trying to find a new path into this other realm and that for me was where the struggle and the uncertainty and the vulnerability was mm. it was um it was as much in my own head as it was in what i was sharing <laughs> yeah i so i saw you um give a similar presentation but a little bit um i don't know progressed i suppose uh mm -hmm. a couple of years later Gosh, this is almost three years ago now, I just realized. Um, but uh, it, this was in at, at Mary Virginia Swanson's uh, marketing master class. You gave a presentation to our, our class there as well. And that would be the first time that I saw any of the images from your new uh, body of work. And, mm -hmm. and I remember you, you talked about at that time a little more about the process that you um, had been going through sort of finding your way into this new work. And one of the things that really struck me about it, thinking about your work, thinking about Snowbound and Oceana, and now the new work, Kronos and Terrestra, that your, um, your, your work seems to take a fairly long time to sort of marinate in, in Snowbound, <laughs> In the um, the uh, the introductory statement, it, you, you mentioned that it take, took you five years to do that. I saw an interview that you did with um, Darren Ching and Deborah Klomp Ching mm -hmm. uh, about Oceana, where you mentioned it took about three years to do that. This work has also taken, you know, multiple years to to sort of develop into what it is. And what you were sort of describing in the the second presentation that I saw you give about this new work, what really struck me was the necessity of giving yourself time to let the work figure out what it is and and finding your way into it. Um, and you shared a couple of of sort of uh, I don't know if they were if they were mistakes exactly not I think that's the wrong word but just sort of early experiments that you were saying and you know and here's an image that really just didn't work for me but finding 
you know, that that being sort of a necessary part of the process of, of, of figuring out that things aren't working and, and, and finding that path. That's such a valuable lesson. I think a lot of people don't necessarily understand, especially when they're a young artist of, of, of not trying to force it and not, you know, coming out with a new series every year, not, um, you know, being able to take that time is, is such a crucial thing for, for so many of us. It was really, really great to get that message. Oh, well, I think that my own, um, my own experiences, not just through photography, but in my own life, have taught me the value of authenticity. Mm. And I think when we experience authentic discovery and authentic um, significance, mm. whether it be in our own thoughts or in the work we do or in encounters we have, there is a way in which Honoring that requires a certain, for me, amount of comprehension. Mm. And comprehension in larger ways comes, for me, in slow ways. Um, I often, you know, looking back, it's easy maybe to see where the dots were. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> But when you are, for myself, when I'm in the midst of exploring something or trying to figure something out, and that is essentially my motivation, I think that when I, that for me, my working, I work in order to answer something mm -hmm. that I'm trying to resolve at a deep level. And it's not just a deep level intellectually. It's a deep internal, personal place. And I know now that that's what uh, feeds me as an artist. And that's what ultimately, I believe, creates really good work that will stand a test of time. When I moved to the desert, I knew that I wanted my next photographic project to explore this space. And I was very ambitious. You know, I thought, okay, well, gosh, I've got this down. I know how to do this now, <laughs> you know, because I had spent so many years cultivating the tools um, that I thought I would simply be able to replicate just in a new space. And when I made an effort to do that, I just kept hitting walls, which is to say, for me, I made images that were, I call them head images. Mm. They were pictures, they were photographs, they were descriptors of what I was seeing. And they were, for the most part, informed by the ideas that I had in my head. And you know what, I could have easily cobbled together a group of these images and kind of thought about ways in which I was exploring certain ideas that were at my at the forefront of my head at the time and put them out into the world and have believed that some people would take them somewhat seriously. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but they meant nothing to me. They meant absolutely nothing mm -hmm. to me. And I realized that my real motivations um, involve a deeper part of myself, an internal, um, my heart. I mean, on a, on a very basic level, my heart was not engaged in the work I was doing because I was so disconnected with this space. Mm. And I had to figure out how to get connected. And I had no idea. There, there's not a, there's not a, a manual <laughs> that you can refer to to figure out on an individual at an individual level how to connect with your desire mm. because my desire was this desert space 
But that's huge. There was so much. There was so much that I could have connected with because I had so many interests. And so finding that authentic path for me required me to just try. And this, of course, happened in retrospect. I didn't know at the time that this was my path, that this was in any way leading me to what my desire was. But all of all I felt was frustration. I mm. felt so frustrated that I couldn't make that connection at a gut level or a heart level. All of my images were just in the head for myself. And I felt lured, like everything in my whole being, my whole body just kept compelling me to seek out water. Mm. And <laughs> on a logical plane, maybe that was because I was landlocked and I missed the water because I had always been surrounded by it, as, as well as it was a familiar area for me because I had spent so many years photographically exploring the snow and water and fog and areas that where water was so prominent. Mm. And I finally yielded to that desire. It was, it was an, an internal longing to go back to the water. And so I, I finally conceded. And from that, Oceana was born. And that emerged after I moved to the desert. Mm. <laughs> and I knew, but I knew even when I exhibited it, um, and even when I shared it, and as I talked about it in the conceptual terms that I talked about it, which was very authentic and real, mm -hmm. I knew at a deep level that it was somehow connected to my desire to photograph and understand the desert. Yeah. Well, I mean, and this sort of gets at, I think, what a lot of people sometimes have trouble with um, in terms of conceptual photography and conceptual art is this idea that it can be very heady, you know, it can be very mm -hmm. intellectual. Um, but I find, and, and this is especially true of your work, sort of gave me the, um, a, an example of how, of how art can be, um, very conceptual, but also, um, feel very authentic at the same time. This thing that you're talking about of needing to find it, needing to find that connection, I think is for me where the best conceptual art always happens that you can, I feel like you can kind of tell when it's like somebody's got their idea and then they go and then they make their images sort of to that rubric. Mm -hmm. Um, and the process that you describe of needing to get past that um, in order to find the real work, that is what really rings true to me. And I think it, it's very apparent in the images as well. But I don't think that, I don't think everybody gets there as an artist. And I don't think that everybody in the audience, you know, I think that that, that is where the audience can sometimes be left feeling a little cold. And it's, I don't know, using that word cold, uh, is a little, um, I don't mean, in, uh, uh, there's a, like, I, get, I feel like there's a pun right, right on, <laughs> on the top of there, you know, <laughs> with the snowbound work, but it's funny because those images of being, you know, obviously they are of cold places, but, um, they don't, they don't strike me as cold images. There, there, there's, there's sort of this sort of internal, warmth to them because mm. because I always feel like with your work whether it was Snowbound or Oceana or the new work that that there's an interiority to them that that really makes it not just about the subject of the photograph or even not necessarily primarily about the subject of the photograph that's I think a really hard thing for especially with photography is a is a hard thing to accomplish I don't know. Yeah. Wow. I just want to say, wow, you get it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and as a photographer, as someone who makes, and I believe that I'm very aware of what ultimately emerges and is meaningful for me because I do go through this extensive process. I, I have not always felt, I have not always felt confident that what I am trying to communicate is truly 
experienced mm. in the same way. And um, to hear you talk about that wonderful, for me, that wonderful simultaneity, that wonderful almost uh, paradox of what the work appears to be and how the work emits or or what what the work appears to be and how the work really is mm. it it just it reminds me of this kind of yin yang this kind of perfect balance of complete opposites and i love that i very much definitely explore that through not just through the work my work in terms of the final images and the, and certainly in the ideas that i'm trying to encompass but even in the very physical aspect of the making of these images it's very laborious and difficult and extreme and i don't want anyone to ever feel that the image was difficult or laborious or extreme <laughs> <laughs> no, that that is definitely not not what comes through with these images. Um, they always feel um, another thing that I find very interesting is you know you're you're these three sort of or I'm not sure if it's three or four uh, bodies of work. <laughs> I, I I wanted to ask you about that, um, but but all of the work of yours that I'm familiar with is um, through these different bodies of work. They each one look very different. They have a very different sort of color palette. They have, um, they're visually different. They're visually very separate from one another. But, mm -hmm. but in, in, at the same time, they're all very recognizably yours. They're all very recognizably coming from the same place. And I always find that really fascinating when you can, you can see the artist in the work that way, you know, when, when, you know, coming to different subjects and, and different ideas, but still being able to see that, that through line, um, mm -hmm. even if it's, even if it's, you know, there's a sense of progression as well, because it's not like the same idea over and over again, but it's, I just find that really fascinating. And I, I feel like, you know, some artists from, from, from series to series or, or, or piece to piece, it, it might kind of feel kind of all over the place. And there's something interesting about that as well. But I just, I often find that the, the artists that I'm really attracted to have sort of this personal stamp that they put on their work that that's present in all of their work. And that that's always something that I find myself really responding to. Well, it's wonderful to hear you say, because I have shared with you the work that I'm that I've been working on currently, and mm. it is ostensibly quite different, mm. at least the subject, the ostensible subject matter, mm -hmm. or the ostensible space that I'm exploring is different. And yet, in many ways, my ideas and the concepts that I am guided by are quite similar mm. um, in terms of, you know, more ephemeral ideas about the world we live in and where we fit into it. Um, something that I am aware of on an, certainly on an intellectual level, but am not at all conscious of as I'm making images is my deeply, deeply embedded sensibility as an artist, as a visual artist of translating a three dimensional world into two dimensions. Mm. And so from, you know, I think Snowbound was very literal in the ways that I compressed space and the ways that I use negative and positive space, mm. the ways that I literally draw with my camera, the way I use color, the way a painter would use color the way I edit out space um, and, and, and really treat the picture plane as a canvas. Um, I think I do that. I, I make those references. I cross those boundaries between our disciplines of photography and painting and sculpture and drawing 
and even to some extent music and even for me narrative or writing mm. um i i love that all of that gets played out through the image and again that's my kind of conceptual underpinning um or my visual handbook of sorts mm. you know um i i grew up it's funny because i think um I want to. I don't remember whether I was in fourth grade or fifth. I, I guess it was in third or fourth grade. I started. I would. I began playing the clarinet, and um, by the end of fifth grade, uh, my school was bought out by someone else, and and I had to go to another school. And I was the, the year between fifth and sixth grades. Um, I I I am. I knew. I had this vision of going to a new school and being a kind of band nerd mm. <laughs> and I didn't want to be a band nerd and I somehow persuaded my parents to believe that I was no longer interested in the clarinet even though I loved it and I practiced all the time and and somehow I just didn't want to continue with the clarinet at this new school and they allowed me to stop um, playing the clarinet but I needed I I I had to have some sort of creative outlook just for myself, and I began taking art. And had I not, you know, I often wonder what would have happened had I continued with the clarinet. Mm. <laughs> um, because I, I kind of happened into an art class with an amazing art teacher in sixth grade who I continued with through eighth grade. And um, even through high school, she continued to be my art teacher through high school. Mm. And... Um, and I just, I have such a deep love and appreciation for drawing and painting and, 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 and the artists who, um, who have, who have remarked upon the times that they were living in. Mm. Uh, and they live in my head, you know, it's funny because even in college, I, you know, I continued taking drawing and painting and printmaking classes, and I certainly took my share of art history classes. And for a period of time, I actually considered pursuing art history as a major, but ultimately decided not to um, because I, I felt <laughs> it's almost funny. I felt it was too easy for mm. me because I got it. I understood, like, I felt like I could get into the heads of so many of these artists. And get what they were getting at. I understood their work almost at an intuitive level. And I didn't want to, to dedicate my life to paying tribute to the art of other people. Mm. I think deep down, I knew, even though I hadn't even given my, myself permission then, I knew that I was a creative soul. Mm. And... Um, and then I, at a deep, soulful level, I wanted to be creating something, something new. Mm. And that does, that isn't to say I always wanted to be an artist. It's just to say that the, the that the making or the processing or the creation, that the, the recognition that something new was valuable, and I wanted to contribute in some way to that. Mm. Uh, well, I can say I'm, I'm, I'm certainly, uh, glad that you, that you decided to become an artist, uh, because otherwise I wouldn't have these wonderful images in my life. So, um, so I, I do want to talk a little more specifically about the new work. Um, if that's all right. Um, First. so you, you sent me some sa sample images, um, and, um, some of which I, I, you, 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 I think you had shown in, um, Swanee's class, um, but many of which were new to me and completely new. And, um, so, and then you, you, you sent along also a statement and, and I was kind of curious. So you, you have two titles here, Kronos and Terrestra. The images are, there are some images here that are, uh, sort of close up images of, um, of minerals, um, mm -hmm. whereas others are, um, more, uh, landscape, um, they're, they're not, I want, I don't want to say traditional landscapes because that doesn't seem right to me, but they're desert landscapes. And it seems from what, what I understand from the, 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 the text that you sent me, these are sort of 
two bodies of work, but I was wondering whether that was quite right, whether, because they, they seem to sort of interlock to me. And I, and I was wondering whether you conceive of these as being two separate series or two parts of a greater whole or sort of something in between. It's a really good question. And I think as I was working on them, the Kronos series developed after Oceana. Mm. Um, and because I didn't, I didn't know what was coming. <laughs> I mean, essentially what happened after, um, once I returned to the desert, having made images kind of at the edges of the sea, I was at the Tucson Gem and Mineral Show one year. And it may have, I think it may have been the second year I actually had attended the show. And I held a crinoid in my hand, which is a fossilized marine animal embedded in limestone and it was the most beautiful perfect sculpture i had ever experienced because not only was it just visually beautiful this this animal that looked like a plant but its historical story of being millions of years old and having been kind of this record um, of a time when the earth was covered in water, but that the time had passed and, you know, this limestone fossil is what had remained it was just everything for me. It was, it was everything that it suggested embedded within its own forms. And it enabled me to walk out of the Tucson hotel and look at the Catalina foothills with a very different sensibility. I understood in that moment that just as I had been seeking out water in a distant place, but trying to understand the desert, seeing the desert as a remnant seabed suddenly enabled me to look through a geological lens through a very different scale of time. Hmm. And that is what I wanted to make manifest to others because it was profound. It was a profound shift for me that connected me to, um, to rock and to, um, these mineral, to mineral, to, to the idea of the land in a different way. Hmm. And all I knew all I knew was that, you know, that perfect sculpture that I held in my hand was something that I was experiencing as I walked through the gym and mineral show with every specimen I picked up. Mm. <laughs> it was this miraculous, oh my God, I'm holding millions and millions of years worth of alchemy and land and water and history in my hand. And you could see it. You could feel it. <laughs> it was mm. amazing. And I began collecting the specimens and um, eventually started photographing them with the hope of, of, of I, I don't know, of, of revealing some of that or manifesting some of that in an image so that others, too, could kind of experience that aha. Yeah. It's, I mean, seeing these, um, these images together, just sort of, uh, mixed together the way that you sent them to me, it, what strikes me is how they echo each other and how, you know, the, the mineral studies, um, and the landscape almost have this relationship, this sort of fractal relationship where one is sort of inside the other is inside the other. And in, in this, in this way, almost like two mirrors pointing at each other and sort of repeating on and into infinity there, there's wow. something really, and, you know, and being able to go back and forth between the two types of images that, that are, that you're presenting okay. here sort of amplifies each one to me, at least in a way that I find really interesting. The thing that you said too, about, about, about having that shift in perception and, and seeing, seeing the remnants of the water in the desert 
it really seems like so much of your work is very um, interested in in what is revealed versus what is hidden. Um, I mean, even in your artist statement, you say you talk about being interested in in time and in um, let me get this exactly right um, in ideas of transition and time passage. There's something I feel like where you're sort of approaching. Uh, whether in Snowbound having this sort of sense of ephemerality or the Kronos and Terrestra having this sense of expansiveness of time where mm -hmm. you're sort of reaching for the eternal mm -hmm. that, um, I don't know, it's just breathtaking. I really love it. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, in answer to your question, how do I think about this work, these two specific series, the creation of the work, as I said, was kind of in a, it was um, unintentional, but it was the mode of working at the time was that I was exploring these minerals and photographing these minerals and thinking about them and thinking about these ideas and wanting the images that I made of them to manifest those ideas, or at least potentially, uh, what would the word be, compel a viewer to consider those ideas as well. And I, I think in an, in an individual, sometimes an individual, a single image can do that. There's an image, for instance, um, actually, you know, there are a couple of images from that mineral study series that do that um, powerfully by exploring ambiguity, by embracing ambiguity, the ambiguity of what is it that we're looking at? Mm -hmm. um, am I looking at a close interior space or am I looking at a panoramic view from an aerial perspective? And there's this, con there's this uncertainty and there's this shift back and forth and there's this play of between worlds that I love and want you know, I wanted that to start happening and it took a long time just through the process of figuring out how to photograph these stones, these minerals. It took me a long time to figure out what I wanted them to do and how I wanted them to do that. I, I was really just working with the basic idea of my own aha, like, mm. oh my God, this is so profound. How do I create an image that can manifest these ideas without having to point to them through language. And, and for me, exploration is, is required and finding what does work and what doesn't work and getting to a place where I finally began making images that did seem to start doing that. And by doing that, I, cre I had this relationship. I was suddenly having this relationship with stone and having a relationship with my own ideas and seeing how the physical world was manifesting these larger historical processes. And it enabled me to then go back into the landscape, which had previously been inaccessible to me conceptually mm. and approach it with that awareness. It was as though a door had been opened for me. Hmm. And that's where this terrestrial work emerges. Yeah. So, so I don't, it's not at all important for me that this work be kept in separate, considered as separate bodies, because frankly, I think of them as very interconnected and intertwined. But at the time I was making them, I was I was naming them because I was, uh, you know, when I realized what I was doing with the minerals, the title Kronos said so much mm. to me. Um, and it was so related to Oceana <laughs> um, because I was exploring time in a, in a more literal way with the, with the minerals. Mm. Um, but I was very much doing the same thing and in a more ephemeral way through water. Um, with Oceana right. and it is 
interesting and valuable and and has been necessary that you know for me that the work the work is really all about this larger arc of inquiry so that all of the images should be able to sit together um, because they were actually really part of this much larger quest that I have embarked upon mm. um, in the physical world. Um. <laughs> <laughs> And I should also say, um, I am going to be exhibiting this series. I'm going to be exhibiting these mineral studies along with my landscape images together. Oh, okay. Under the title, under the title of Terrestra at Klumpchin Gallery in January. Right. Um, well, I could keep talking about this forever, um, but why don't we take a quick little break and then um, come back and do the second segment. Okay, right. this has been wonderful. <laughs> So for the second segment, I always ask the guests to bring a topic of their own, which can be whatever you'd like to talk about, whatever's on your mind. So what would you like to talk about today? I would love to hear your thoughts because you are so deeply articulate oh, and, <laughs> and thoughtful. Your thoughts on the place of not only art but also contemplative art in the world that we find ourselves living in right now. Oh, goodness gracious. That is a big one. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's interesting you'd ask that because it's something I have been thinking about a fair amount mm -hmm. um, as a person who, um, you know, I, I would probably describe my own work, whether writing or, or, um, photography as being fairly contemplative. And I, and I've been asking myself a lot lately what, I mean, on, on some level, the question I've been asking myself is what is the point of all of this? And, um, and especially now, and I will have to admit that this year has been, it's been difficult for me to make anything this year. Um, yeah. I've been very focused on, on sort of more direct action, um, rather than making work this year, but that's also led me to, I've been feeling the loss of it as well. The feeling of not having been as creative this year is sort of dragging on me. It's, it's been, a, uh, on my mind a lot. And I think that what I keep coming back to is that I don't know if art can change the world, but what I, what I, what I feel very strongly is that what art allows us to do um, more in a more direct and a more impactful way than just about any anything else that I can think of is to have the opportunity to access someone else's state of mind and someone else's experiences. And I feel like that right now is a really important thing that so much of what we're dealing with right now has to do with polarization and people not understanding each other. And, you know, to be honest, I don't think that the burden is on everyone to understand everyone else. But I think that, you know, that some people have more responsibility to try to understand people that they've never tried to understand before. Mm -hmm. And I feel like art gives us the ability to, to, to do that. And that contemplative art requires a certain quietness of mind and it requires a certain slowness, uh, a certain deliberative nature to how you consume it, how you regard it. And that is also something that I feel we could really do with right now that mm -hmm. so much is, um, of our culture right now is on the sort of instant reaction 
and there's a place for that. But being able to take the time and really consider something and really consider what it means to be in the world, what it means to be unique, but what it means to be similar and part of a greater whole. I think all of those things are things that we could use more of right now. So I, that's what my hope is anyway, but I would also love to hear your thoughts. Well, it's, it's interesting because I, um, I similarly obviously have found myself thinking, considering these ideas in, in larger ways. Um, and it's interesting because I recently returned from a review event, which is the first review event I have gone to in probably eight years. Mm. That's right. And, you were just at Photo Nola. Yes. And I took this work and, um, I, I had the opportunity to share it with someone who I had shown it to at an earlier stage and the response was so interesting. And I think that I recognize what she was trying to say without a doubt. But I also recognize a kind of larger view that not everybody can see quite yet. Mm -hmm. And her response was essentially, you know, a beautiful contemplative monograph. I can understand how that might be something that you would want for this work, for it to be, you know, exist in this kind of perfect space on a wall of a gallery. But it really needs to be used to change the world in the ways that the world needs to be changed, you know. So, so you need to contact REI, you need to contact Patagonia, let them use these images, let them, you know, fight the fight with this work. And her message, of course, was very well intended, which is actively engage in the political arena um, that we are all finding ourselves in, in so many ways. Use your art to make to be a political force for change in a literal way and i i totally i am a hundred percent on board with the in the necessity for each of us each of us as members of society to be the change we want to see in the world and to live in accordance with the principles of how we want that world to be. Um, and that does, as you said, require action on all of our parts it, and, and not no passivity, no sitting by, no waiting to see what other people do, but actual involvement, action. Um, I think that our relationship to government has shifted ex in, in extraordinary ways um, so that we're we are truly becoming a more representative government in that we're requiring our representatives to represent us. Right. Um, and we're holding them accountable. And yet at the same time with this work, I do believe that it's important for us to heal ourselves at the same time that we're fighting for greater important causes because the reason why we're fighting for greater important causes is so that we can embrace each other in love and total acceptance. That is the world we're working so feverishly to create, I believe. Mm -hmm. And all of the, you know, the, everything that's kind of coming out of these dark abysses of sorts, you know, the underbelly of um, the world that we've been living in has finally started emerging and, and creating such instability in the world because there is such great inequity in the world. And there's so little balance of power as well as acknowledgement of humanity 
around the world, not only within our country, but across the world. And so we're at we're at a huge transition point. We're at a time when it's like this deep uprising, kind of coming out and requiring acknowledgement and confrontation and healing. And I'd like to believe that there is a place for for art as a great unifier, a human unifier, yeah. a unifier of humanity that can go beyond the distinct differences, which are absolutely vital and necessary to acknowledge um, and honor, but that ultimately we, we as humans deserve and require to be treated with great dignity, honor, and respect. And I, I, just, I just believe that that is the message that the earth holds for us because we all feel so connected to this planet and, and to our surroundings, to the land that we come from. I think everybody has a deep connection to those experiences and that that can be a very healing journey for us all. Yeah. You know, something I think a lot about is um, that I've, I, between talking with um, visual artists and talking with, with writers and especially um, fiction writers who I've, I've been talking to more often over the past couple of years that there is often this feeling among many fiction writers that I talk to now this year that, you know, maybe, maybe this story that I'm working on isn't the, the right one for this time. Maybe I need to be making something that is more overtly political, something that is more overtly, um, you know, socially relevant. Mm -hmm. um, that's a conversation that I've been having with a lot of people or that I've been witnessing happening online a lot. And one of the threads that keeps coming up, coming back as sort of a pushback to that idea is that, that there really is no such thing as art that is socially or politically neutral, you know, <laughs> that, that ultimately politics and society are reflections of, of humanity and that, that putting something out in the world that is reflective of some piece of humanity and that allows people to connect with something and allows them to experience emotions that that is in itself a political act, you know? And, and, you know, like I said, I don't know if art can change the world, but I think, but I know that art can change a person. And, and I think that there is something pretty profound about that. You know, some of the most, profound experiences that I've had this year um, have not necessarily been the ones where I've been at a rally or something, you know, I mean, although I, I, I think that's important, but the ones that I, that have really carried me through have all come through art and literature, you know, that they've all come from, you know, the most connected that I ever feel to, the rest of humanity always comes well, almost always. I mean, you know, obviously I have my children and I have my family and that there's a, there's a connection that, that's very profound in that as well. But, you know, in, in a larger sense, the, the concept of humanity can be so distant and, and sort of nebulous at times, not, not concrete in the way that family is concrete mm -hmm. and, and feeling you know, the, the, this year has been so sort of exhausting and alienating in so many ways. And, 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 and it's the kind of thing that makes you want to give up. But what always brings me back are, you know, if I read a poem that is, that is just perfectly expressive, you know, whether it is a more fiery sort of political one, or if it's something like, 
you know, I was talking to a writer, Celeste Ng, on the show recently, and she mentioned this this poem by Wendy Cope called The Orange, which is just this lovely little sweet moment and just about, you know, happiness and in, in a mundane kind of way. And it, it it's very sweet. It's the kind of thing that you could almost find saccharine, but it's it really... I think speaks to some something sort of um primal, you know, this need to feel connected to something. I think that and 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 it did provide that for me. I think that, you know, work like yours invites you as as of as the audience, it invites you to consider your place in the world, your connection to the land. But more than that, your, your sort of connection to yourself, which is another thing that I think, you know, I, I look around at what's going on today, and so much of it seems really driven by this really profound lack of self-awareness. Mm. And, you know, like I, I made a joke a few days ago that like, you know, I wonder how much of this, of all of our current troubles could be, could have been at least not quite as bad if, if everybody had the opportunity to go to therapy. <laughs> mm. <laughs> wow. Um, no, I, I can recognize, you know, I, I would agree with you a hundred percent. I mean, I can't help but think at the same time of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Oh yeah. And, Somewhere in there, you know, kind of at the midpoint of having your needs, having all of your needs met and then kind of getting to a higher level of um, uh, the need to feel, you know, there's certainly the, the need to feel secure, the need, the need to have food, the need to have shelter, the need to have to feel secure, the need to have, an, you know, to have feel like there is a place in the world for you. You know, it's it's at the higher levels that contemplation and purpose really evolve. But feeling connected is somewhere, I think, in the middle. Mm. And so what, you know, what you're kind of suggesting is that by knowing oneself, it enables one, I don't know, I, I this is my own op- you know, Psych 101, by knowing oneself, enables one to feel connected and responsible in one's own life, kind of in one's own skin, Mm -hmm. without holding other people responsible for your own life or for your own choices. And that's that does get complicated, especially when we look at societies that are you know, in which there are you know authoritarian societies or in which, you know, there's been military rule for a, a prolonged period of time. You know, the, the question of how much freedom and security can a person actually experience. And, and in that respect, we're looking at much lower level needs. But certainly within our own country, I think in general, we... You know, there we're a little bit, and and this is not at all to say that we've we're taking care of everybody because we're not as a country. But I, I think if we get to a place where we individually take care of ourselves, but also individually recognize our sense, our responsibility to take care of everybody else, that it's not a it's not a contradictory thing. It's yeah. actually, it's actually completely intentional mm-hmm. that we are, we are each other. You know, we're not just ourselves. And I think what our culture, unfortunately, um, has developed into is this place whereby individuals have stopped really caring about the larger community. Yeah, and think of their community as their as their family unit. Mm-hmm. 
or other people who are like them, which consists, which kind of creates their larger community. You know, yeah. it's basically an incestuous community of people just like myself. Yeah. <laughs> and yet, you know, we are part of a much broader world. And um, I think, you know, our sense of compassion and empathy and responsibility for everybody else in order to, to truly treat each other as equals has not evolved in sync with many other parts of our evolution. Yeah. I think that the, what it comes down to for me is that it, it is really hard to to have a generosity of spirit and a generosity of empathy when, you know, and, and, and to be able to, to even be willing to try to understand other people, which I mm -hmm. think is really the root of things right now that people don't understand each other. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to even get to the place where you would be willing to try to do that. If on some level you are not, aware of your yourself and your own sort of emotional processes. I, I had to go to a lot of therapy to get to the point where, where I uh, realized that, you know, taking responsibility for my own emotional state mm -hmm. was so necessary. And that allowed me to be more emotionally generous to other people. Whereas if I felt like, like things were happening because other people were, you know, my emotions were somebody else's responsibility or mm. that some other people needed to take care of that for me, then it made me really closed off and defensive all the time. And obviously, like, I'm in a place, you know, as a fairly affluent person where, you know, my basic needs are met. So it's not like I'm in the same position as someone who is truly suffering um, materially, but I think that I also don't think that it can be said that a lot, that all of the problems that are being inflicted on us are coming from people who are materially suffering. I think a lot of it is happening from people who are doing just fine, you know? So, and, and it's, and so in that case, it just, it just comes back to like, why would, what, do, what do people need in order to feel like they don't have to take advantage of other people, you know? Um, well, I think that um, you've really hit the nail on the head, <laughs> <laughs> and maybe where you, you know, you learned that about yourself through therapy. I learned that about myself through the through divorce. <laughs> 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 Is that there's a point at which you have to look in a mirror mm -hmm. and recognize that a lot of the emotional triggers that you're experiencing in your in interactions with others it has less to do about the other mm -hmm. and more to do with oneself. And, um, and that very basic understanding is unfortunately not one that as a culture, we really understand or embrace. Yeah. And, um, in large part because it's too easy to point our finger and say, no, 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 well, this is really, this, this is real. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this really is the cause of my pain. But the cause of one's pain oftentimes is a much deeper emotional source, yeah. which um, often, and this is, uh, once again, you know, my armchair analysis <laughs> is often rooted in some experience of lack of love. Yeah. Some experience of that. And I think that we have grown up in a world that just has a shortage of love yeah. for each other. And, um, you know, it happens in the, it happens across socioeconomic boundaries it's 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 unfortunately characteristic of so much of our culture mm -hmm. that we we have become so motivated by external goals 
that we have lost sight of our greater, our greatest gift yeah. of, of love and connectedness. Yeah. And that is what I really, I, I, that's what I keep coming back to, you know, when it comes to art and especially art that's quieter, you know, art that is, that really requires and invites you to spend time with it to, un, to fully unfold that, you know, that there's a sort of meditation in that and that finding a more peaceful internal space, um, is something that I think I, you know, I just got to hope I got to think that that is something that that's useful. Well, I honestly believe that that is the divine, that that experience of ourselves in its purest and most peaceful state is the experience of the divine within mm. us. And so how can you argue, how can you argue that being unnecessary? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so the, um, the last question that I, that I always ask everyone before we go, um, this mm -hmm. has been a, a, an amazing conversation on my end, at least I've been really enjoying it. Oh, um, I love, I've loved talking to you. you. As I said, you're a deep thinker and I'm, I feel that we've been in a sincere conversation and dialogue, which is great. You. Me too. Um, the last question that I ask everyone is, whether there is a piece of um, art or literature or just general creativity that you've experienced recently that meant something to you? Mm. I think music. Mm. Music has been incredibly powerful for me. And just, yeah, I would have to say just this past weekend, um, I was in New Orleans and listening to a blues musician and artist. Um, his name is Cedric. I think it's C-E-D-R-I-C -E um, at a local bar. And listening to, he is a Mississippi blues man. I mean, he, his, his roots run really deep. And I was actually thinking of him when I was thinking about how we haven't, solved all the problems even in our own country because um in areas you know i was i was told by someone who knows him well that you know there's still there are still people who are living super simple lives in the heart of the delta without modern conveniences but his music his music is so deep and at the same time, it's his voice, which is this kind of soulful, gravelly, lyrical, melodic voice that tells stories, touches a place that is at once hard and difficult and painful and yet ebullient and joyful and happy at the same time. It's just... And to, to feel all of that, to experience all of that in a, you know, in vibration form, you know, in the form of music. So it just passes through your body and all I want, all I did was dance and it's just so profound, so profound. I think um, experiencing music in person, whether it's music at a bar or symphonic music in a big concert hall for me has always been profound mm. and, and uh, rejuvenating. And, and, and it's, for me, it's kind of a, a, an elixir for optimism mm. an optimism of the human spirit. Mm. Well, thank you so much for talking with me. I, I really enjoyed our conversation. I did too. I really did. Thank you so much. Okay, so as I mentioned at the top of the show, Lisa's Terrestra exhibition will be at Klompching Gallery in Brooklyn, New York through February 24th. So if you are in the area, do be sure to stop by. And that is our show. 
you'd like to get in touch, you can find all of the show's contact and social media info in the show notes. If you'd like to support the show, a monthly pledge in any amount to our Patreon campaign is greatly appreciated. You can find that at patreon.com slash sake river. That's sake like the drink and river like river. Our theme music is by Poddington Bear. You can find more of his music available for licensing at soundofpicture.com. Our next episode comes out January 31st, and that will be a conversation with photographer Linda Alterwitz, so be sure to come back for that. And until then, remember, keep the channel open. Uh-oh.